I'd like to call this meeting to order. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Thank you. Um, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence to honor the memories of Shea Middle School student Josiah Botella and Ari Almeida Garcia, who was a student at Sweetwater Community School, both lives lost their lives this last week. Thank you, if you'll all join us. Thank you. May I introduce the jazz pan over here who entertained us before the meeting? May we all give them a round of applause? They, they are from Shadow Mountain and they did a fabulous job. Are there parents of the jazz band here tonight? Raise your hand if your parents here. Yeah, I know they can drive they themselves. They all drove themselves, Nancy. Fabulous teacher, Nathan Simon. Thank you so much. That was great. Next on the agenda, um, Dr. Bells, approval of agenda. Oh, excuse me. May I have roll call, please? Mrs. Baker. Here. Mrs. Greenberg. Here. Mrs. Christensen. Here. Mrs. Case? Here. Mr. Pantera? Here. Next on the agenda, approval of agenda, Dr. Bells. Th thank you, President Case. Items approved by consent will not come up for discussion during the meeting, but will be approved when the agenda is adopted. This is possible since members of the governing board receive the agenda, along with backup materials, at least 24 hours prior to the meeting and have time to review and consider all items. Prior to the agenda being adopted, members of the governing board or audience may ask that an item be removed from the consent agenda and brought to the floor for discussion at the appropriate place on the agenda. I would like to offer the agenda as posted. Does any member of the governing board wish to have an item removed from the consent agenda? Does any member of the audience wish to have an item removed from the consent agenda? Seeing none, Mrs. Christensen, may I have a motion to approve the meeting agenda and recommended consent agenda items? So moved. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion passes unanimously. Next on the agenda, governing board statements. Um, Mrs. Christensen. I would just like to welcome everybody here. This is a big crowd today. And I know you'll all dwindle down as the meeting goes through, but uh, it's so nice to see so many students here. It's amazing. And I really, I know they left, but I really enjoyed the jazz band. Back in the day, I was a clarinet player. I wasn't that good, but <laughs> I always appreciate hearing good music. So congratulations to all our wonderful student achievers today. Mrs. Baker. Thank you. I just want to echo uh, Mrs. Christensen's statement about welcoming everyone, seeing such a big crowd to, you know, 
support our district and our students who are getting recognized. Um, we also almost made it through another school year. It took the dedication of students, parents, educators, staff, cabinet, all of us to cross this finish line. Um, and now is the time we get to celebrate the end of the school year, all the lasts, all the class parties, the graduations. Um, we love to give awards and acknowledge how hard all of our students work to get where they are and the teachers and parents who help make it all possible. I got to attend Pinnacle's end of the year choir band and orchestra concert and it was amazing. Um, I toured first grade habitats at Fireside and helped spoil teachers for Teacher Appreciation Week. Uh, as a mom in the district, I love going to the class parties. I look forward to the sixth grade clap out at Fireside um, and also the celebration of my own graduating senior. My son had teachers here who loved him, supported him, taught him, and um, I'm so grateful. I don't know where the year went. I feel like we were just celebrating all the firsts. Um, and as the years fly by, we need to remember that we're here for the students and, and there are children and they deserve the best of us and we always need to keep them in mind. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Greenberg? Um, had the opportunity to attend a few events over the past few weeks or a couple weeks since our last meeting. Um, Last week was our silver anniversary and retiree celebration, and it was wonderful as we acknowledge, um, you know, all of our, our teachers and staff and everyone here at, at PV. Uh, some folks have been here for quite a number of years, and um, it was really exciting to see um, everybody who was there and congratulate everybody who was there. And last week, um, as part of the celebration for Teacher Appreciation Week, um, actually Wednesday was also School Nurse Appreciation Day. And I had the opportunity to join in a celebration of school nurses that was put on by um, the Department of Ed. And it was a Zoom uh, celebration from around the state. And it was great to see all of the folks there. I think we had one or two of our nurses from PD on that, um, I wouldn't say call, but meeting in that celebration, it was great. And also earlier this week, I was at Quail Run as the students were doing their end of year IB presentations. And um, as always, uh, the insights and the research that our students do for those presentations, they pick a topic, they form a group, they learn to work in teams, they do, you know, all of this collaborative work and the very topics that you get were extraordinary from, you know, several, uh, I saw a handful that were um, working on pollution and climate change and another uh, group that did homeopathic medicines and compared Western and Eastern medicines. And I, I mean, it's just it, amazing. And this is in one of our elementary schools. So it's exciting um, to see those every year and, and um, you know, see where our students go with those. And with that, I also just want to say, you know, one more week. I hope everybody has a great week. I know first graduation is tomorrow at Roadrunner. And um, obviously next week we have a number so of graduations happening. And I just want to say, since we won't be seeing you, everybody have a great summer. Thank you to our community. Thank you to our parents, to our students and teachers and all of our staff. Thank you, Mr. Pantera. Pantera, yeah, that's yes, me. Yes, Pantera, I know. Pantera. Pantera. Good evening, everyone. Uh, you braved the weather to be here. and I'm, I'm, That's commendable way to go. I too have visited a lot of different schools, um, saw some of the same things you've mentioned here, so I won't go into those. I really uh, went down memory lane when I went to uh, Pinnacle Peak Preparatory because that's a K-8 school. Um, it's a, like basically another one of our middle schools. And it reminded me when I was going to school in Scottsdale, Hohokam, we were a K-8 school. And so I kept looking around and comparing the two and they were, the only thing they had in common was K-8. Okay, that was it. Uh, very different. It's a uh, middle school world there is different than the one I experienced. It was wonderful. I saw so much, so much STEAM, STEM uh, engineering kind of things. Too much to mention here. All these 3D printers, though, the one thing I didn't notice, which kind of surprised me, was no one was doing a 3D printer version of a bolo tie. Yeah. And I just don't get it. All right. But maybe it's just me. I don't know. Um, this is, um, you probably all know, Mental Health Awareness Month. 
Um, and when I thought about that, and I thought about my father, who was a counselor uh, at Scottsdale, he was my counselor at Scottsdale at Saguaro High School. If I was uh, kissing a girl in second period, here's hearing about it in third period. In sixth period, we're having a conversation. Okay, so that's what it's like to have a father, the counselor at high school. But I, I thought about what he would think about what we're doing in our school districts now, especially our school district, when it comes to uh, the emotional safety of our students. And school after school, there's some system in place, uh, especially at the elementary levels and middle schools, to uh, address and help students through all the different problems and um, situations that they encounter to give them the tools they need for emotional growth and safety. He would have loved that. So many things that he said came to, uh, by the time a student gets to high school and can finally confide in someone, some of these problems are too deep and, and too uh, harsh and very difficult to uh, help them come over. He said starting early and being proactive about these things is great. And I'm very proud that we do that in our district, and I know we're going to continue to do that. Uh, thank you all for uh, making it through the year, okay? Uh, we got to remember, though, the end of the year is not always so positive for some kids. They love being in school, right? And uh, so it's kind of a sad time for some of them. Keep that in mind, too. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patera and Tira. I do know your name. <laughs> I know you my don't. mouth this... isn't working. Hey, mine okay, never um, right. I wanted to mention the um, 25 year and retiring party. It was amazing. It was so wonderful to be amongst people that I have literally known for decades, and and just to tell them thank you. And some of them are continuing with us, and we're so appreciative of that. And then others are retiring, and. The VIP comes along and says, oh, please join us. And they say, just take six months off and then come join us. But it was just wonderful. And it just, I love being in the Paradise Valley School District. And there's so many positive things that we talk about. Um, also, uh, this week I was at Closing Bell in UPC. And, um, it, it, you know, and, and we were honoring Lisa Holberg, but in part because she's leaving, her son is graduating out of the district from UPC. But we got to listen to the cabinet and Dr. Bells explain all the programs that go on in the district. And if you want to listen to something cool, go, go to the UPC website and listen to that. Because even though I hear these things all the time, to have an overview like that, I don't get that even as a board member very often. And it was really cool to see the many, many, many things that are happening in this district and how student focused we are and that we want the students to succeed and we have this program in place because this will help them in this way or this item or whatever it is from all angles. And I just really appreciated that bird's eye view of looking at many, many areas of the district at one time. That was really nice for me. Um, graduation is around the corner. Tomorrow and then next week, we are so excited for all these seniors, and we hope everyone is, please be safe. Please, parents, teachers, advise them, be safe. We want you to go on to college and trade schools. We want you to be successful, but we want you to be safe also. And I've been talking to various patient, uh, parents lately, and they've all had really exceptional years. And I'm so grateful that things have returned where we can have prom and we can do all those things that... We used to always do, and I'm so grateful that we're involved with those things, and they've come back, and the kids feel it. They're so excited. As I've gone to Student Voice, and the kids are going, oh, we got to have prom. We got to do this. We got to do this, and that's what I took for granted for years, and then it went away, and now they're more appreciative of it, and I'm just grateful that so many things are working together. So many people are working together for the benefit of the student, and that's what we're all about. What is best for kids? So thank you very much. Next on the agenda is awards and recognitions. Dr. Bells. Thank you, President Case, uh, Governing Board members, Cabinet, and guests. It's always a pleasure to highlight and uh, recognize our students and staff awards and recognitions. Uh, Mr. Drogi will MC the honors tonight. So at this time, I would like to invite you down, uh, the Governing Board down to join me in front of the dais.
Good evening, President Case, governing board members, Dr. Bales, members of cabinet, and attendees both in person and virtual. Tonight, we have several recognitions to share with you. This evening, we'll be inviting our honorees to the front of the room for recognition and a photo. Uh, please make your way to the front of the room when I call your name. Our first honoree was selected as one of 161 national finalists of the 2023 U.S. Presidential Scholars Program and is the only winner in Arizona in career and technical education category. This program recognizes and celebrates distinguished graduating high school seniors and is one of the nation's highest honors for high school students. Please join me in congratulating the 2023 U.S. Presidential Scholar winner, Tej Desai. Our next honoree has been selected as the 2023 recipient of the Arizona Dance Education Organization's Artistic Merit Leadership and Academic Achievement Award. This award is the highest student dance award in the nation. On our application, the student scored in the top 15%, earning 770.5 points out of a total of 800 points. Such an honor is a testament to her individual achievements, dedication, and skills. Please join me in a round of applause for Shadow Mountain High School student, Jessica Henry. Pinnacle High School's DECA presence at the International Career and Development Conference solidified their position as top performers in the DECA program, which has participants from around the globe. In addition to learning, growing, and taking part in many networking opportunities, two Pinnacle Juniors made quite an impact when they placed first in their respective categories, independent entrepreneurship, plan a 20-page business proposal, and apparel and accessories case study role play category. Please help me welcome our two honorees who dominated at this year's event from Pinnacle High School, Landon Stone and Skylar Teagarden. There you go. Our next honorees are exceptional athletes who have made quite a name for themselves in the area of track and field. These athletes are an inspiration to their peers and community alike. Please hold your applause until I call out all of the names. However, you can help me welcome the 2023 AIA Division I and II track and field state champions. From Pinnacle High School, girls 800 meter run and open state championship 800 meter, Gabriella Chiara. From Horizon High School, boys 1600 meter run, Donovan Biddix. From North Canyon High School, boys shot put, Emmanuel Hernandez. From North Canyon High School, long jump and triple jump, Gloria Hase. Also from North Canyon High School in the 100 meter dash, 200 meter dash, and part of the four by 100 meter relay. Also a winner of the Open State Championship 200 meter, Jenea Hill. Rounding out the rest of the four by 100 meter relay, Brianna Strouder, Olivia Hase, Lanaya McLeod.
The North Canyon High School girls track team also won the girls track and field division two state championships. If we could have them all come up to the front of the room for a big round of applause. Our next groups, comprised of students from all of our high schools housed at Horizon, has once again made a tremendous impact in the exciting and dynamic world of Winter Guard. This impressive group has earned a reputation as an outstanding and innovative group. They recently won the Winter Guard Arizona Scholastic A Division State Championship. Please join me in congratulating the Horizon Winter Guard as they come to the front of the room. Next, the Horizon Indoor Percussion Ensemble recently won the Winter Guard Arizona Scholastic A Class and Division State Championship. Please join me in congratulating the Horizon Indoor Percussion Ensemble as they come to the front of the room. Parents while, well, parents, while they're making their way to the front, you are welcome to come up and take pictures. You guys weren't going to follow me. Well, of course, we were waiting for you to go. You're, You're a leader. leader. Everywhere. Right? <laughs> right. You're a fearless leader, man. <laughs> I just need permission. I'll stand in front of Julian. Don't, don't stand in front of her. <laughs> Julian, yeah, yeah. And, and now they are all up here. <laughs> See, Hunter back. <laughs> yeah. I would be the one that would back. <laughs> And the last recognition this evening is our administrators leaving PV schools. We'd like to acknowledge these administrators who have dedicated their careers to student success right here in Paradise. Throughout their time in the district, they've made a difference in the lives of students and staff. Presenting the honors, Dr. Bales.
well, I have the pleasure of having some help tonight uh, to help me with their direct report recognitions, uh, beginning with our Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum Instruction, Dr. Dan Corson. Good evening. Michelle Pavlik Bischoff is unable to join us this evening, but what a difference she has made for Paradise Valley. Michelle retired earlier this year as PB Schools ESSER coordinator, a position she held for two years. Michelle has served PB for 30 years and has had an exceptional career as a teacher, an instructional coach, a teacher on assignment, and principal. She has worked in Hidden Hills, Era Libre, Cactus View, Snorren Sky, and Greycock. Michelle is always led with a vision and passion to support all students. This was very evident in her willingness to serve the district as ESSER coordinator and lead efforts to leverage ESSER funding to close COVID achievement gaps for PV students. We wish Michelle a wonderful retirement as she spends time traveling and joining her family. I am also thrilled to celebrate Rita Tantillo. Rita has served our district as Director of Language Acquisition since 2008. She started her career in 1982 as a teacher and then Title Programs Coordinator. In each of her roles, Rita has been passionate and innovative leader who has left a legacy in PV schools. Her work with language acquisition in developing models of instruction, coaching teachers and principals in evidence-based practices, and implementing structures to support second language learners has been a point of pride for PB schools and a model for other districts to follow. Rita is looking forward to spending time with her family and traveling. We wish Rita a wonderful retirement and thank her for an extraordinary career in PB. Helping us uh, recognize our, from our secondary schools, Mr. Long. Thank you and good evening. It is my distinct pleasure to recognize after 20 years of service to uh, PV, the retirement of Kyle Shappy, who was unable to be with us this evening. He has been principal of Explorer Middle School for the past seven years. He has previously served as principal of Copper Canyon Elementary. Kyle is a strong and quiet leader who always takes a back seat to his team. Any time that I would compliment him on the great things happening in Explore, he would immediately say it's the teachers and staff that makes this a great place. Well, Kyle, it takes a great leader to understand the nuances of when to step forward and when to hang back. That is why your leadership will be missed. Congratulations on your retirement. <clears throat> This evening, I would like to recognize Becky McGowan. Ms. McGowan began her PV career in 1980 as a business teacher. She is currently the Director of Career and Technical Education, a role she has held for the past six years after serving as the Assistant Director of CTE and holding teaching positions at Shadow Mountain, Horizon, and Paradise Valley High Schools. In total, Ms. McGowan has brilliantly, faithfully, and with class dedicated 43 years of service to PV. She was so proud last year of instituting PV's first CTE signing day because she truly believes in career and technical education as a pathway for students in life and future education. Becky, we will miss you, your positive energy, but promise to carry on the work that you have committed to for 43 years. Congratulations. Helping me recognize 
some of those leaders in our uh, business services and business operations. Dr. Holmes will handle that for uh, Ms. Berrigan, who's unable to be here tonight with us. Dr. Holmes. Thank you, Dr. Bales. Uh, not able to be with us tonight, uh, Joe Sagona grew up on a farm in New York, and at the age of two, he was photographed on a John Deere uh, tractor and has been hooked ever since. Uh, taking care of, a, yeah, wait, wait till I get into this a little bit. Uh, taking care of a farm equipment led him to becoming a heavy equipment mechanic. Uh, in 1994, he was hired as senior mechanic uh, at PVUSD and worked on district ground vehicles. Uh, in 2007, he became the garage uh, maintenance supervisor. Uh, Joe is loyal and hardworking. In the role of maintenance supervisor, uh, he has contributed in a way that impacts the district positively. For example, uh, purchasing buses with the AC units on the bottom of the bus instead of the roof to prevent damage to both the AC units and low-hanging objects, uh, such as tree branches, solar panels, and, and other stuff that none of us ever really think about, but Joe does. Um, he's also an aggressive negotiator that uh, always looks to capitalize on opportunities that will benefit the district financially. In his personal life, he's been president of the Arizona Early Day Gas Engine and Tractor Association. I can repeat that if you want to. <laughs> Numerous times throughout his, I didn't even know that existed. <laughs> his, uh, uh, his passions are restoring antique tractors and spending time with his eight dogs. He owns... 125 antique tractors. I think some of them are John Deere. And doesn't have a count on the number of toy antique tractors and school buses he has collected. Uh, when asked about his love of tractors, he stated with a chuckle, it's an addiction. Yeah, he's That's clearly right on the spot, right? Uh, we want to thank Joe for his 24 years of service to PV schools. Congratulations, Joe. Me. Also not able to be with us this evening, but greatly for appreciated for his service, uh, Rudy Martinez uh, has been an essential member uh, of the Paradise Valley Unified School, uh, School District for almost three decades. Uh, he began his tenure with the district uh, in 1994, serving in a variety of roles, uh, including maintenance tech one, three, four, and five. Uh, in 2014, he was appointed as the Director of Facilities and Construction, a position he has held for nearly a decade. Uh, during his time as uh, the Director of Facilities and Construction, Rudy has played a crucial role in uh, ensuring that the district's facilities are safe, functional, and conducive to learning. Uh, he has overseen numerous construction and renovation projects, including the construction of new schools and the renov renovation of existing facilities. Uh, Rudy has made a significant contribution to the uh, Paradise Valley Unified School District throughout his career, his expertise in facilities management and construction, and his tireless work ethic have all helped to ensure the district's facilities are top-notch, uh, and his contributions are uh, deeply appreciated by all who have had the pleasure of working with him. Congratulations to Rudy. Moving on to HR and specifically in benefits, uh, Lisa Simpson was born in Patterson, New Jersey, where she lived for 11 years before moving to Arizona. And on arrival, attended Desert Shadows Middle School uh, in Paradise Valley High School for one year before moving to the then brand new Horizon High School, where she graduated. And that was just a few years ago. Uh, she then went off to NAU, where she earned her journalism degree, and soon after married Ken, uh, who I believe most of you know, uh, in 1988, uh, they are blessed uh, with two children, both of whom work for PV schools, uh, Cody in facilities and Chelsea at Shea Middle School. Uh, Lisa uh, has, uh, has been in HR and mostly benefits since 2001 uh, and has been our benefits coordinator since uh, 2021. Uh, she is a tremendous source of knowledge uh, regarding benefits and institutional history. And we are sad, probably mostly me, <laughs> sad to see her retire, uh, but at the same time excited for her future as she plans to spend more time with family and friends and finally begins to start checking off boxes on her to-do list, which uh, has really been doing nothing but collecting dust. Uh, and on behalf of the department, uh, I just want to say congratulations, uh, Lisa, on your well-deserved retirement. We are very much going to miss you. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat>
And uh, helping us finish with our elementary principal that's retiring this year, Dr. Jarris. It is my pleasure to recognize Mr. Jerry Withers. Mr. Withers has been an educator in PV for 22 years. He started his PV journey in 2001 as a second grade teacher at Air Libre, where he also taught first grade, fourth grade, and technology, and later he taught second grade at Echo Mountain. As the principal of Campo Bello and now Sunset Canyon, Jerry has been the consummate advocate for student success. He has been committed to developing positive learning environments where students and staff feel safe, supported, and connected. He has demonstrated tremendous creativity in his leadership as he has never shied away from thinking outside of the box. Among all of his great talents and accomplishments, I've been most impressed by his ability to be a true leader in the community. Mr. Withers has successfully partnered with several churches, businesses, and agencies, resulting in countless volunteer hours that have been uh, supportive of his schools. Under his leadership, the community has truly been able to come together and connect in the name of supporting students. In 2019, he received the School Safety Leadership Award from the School Resource Officers Association, and he has been asked to speak at the School Connect Summit for three years in a row. On top of all of this, if you have not seen his work, he has amazing woodworking skills, and I'm very envious. It has been a privilege to work alongside Mr. Withers, and I wish him the best in his retirement. And that president case concludes this evening's awards and recognitions. Next on the agenda, please turn your attention to the video monitors for the next section. Call to the public is about to convene. This portion of today's meeting allows the public the opportunity to address the governing board. Although state law does not require that the governing board hold a call to the public, the Paradise Valley Unified School District and its board have chosen to do so because we believe it's important to hear about concerns and issues from our community. While call to the public is not designed to be a discussion, the board is here to listen. Due to Arizona Open Meeting Law, the Governing Board cannot respond to, discuss, or take any action on items brought up during this time. However, staff members may be directed to get back to you and address individual concerns. As a reminder, the point of this and every board meeting is to accomplish the business at hand and to be able to do so in an open and collaborative way. All in attendance are expected to observe meeting rules as well as rules of politeness and decorum so that we may serve as an example to our students that issues can be discussed in a respectful and civil manner. Tonight we have two people who have submitted comment cards prior to the start of the meeting. Each speaker will have three minutes for remarks. First we have 
Je Jennifer Ariza, and then Gilbert uh, Para. Para. Hi, my name is Jennifer Ariza. <clears throat> First, I want to thank you uh, each for the time that you take to put into each of your positions and that you're very professional in how you conduct your board meetings. And I do personally find it very encouraging to see all the recognition for the students and staff. I stand here tonight as the concerned parent in the Paradise Valley School District, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. My concern as a parent in the district is the education and welfare of the students. As I stand here tonight, I want to declare that pornography should not be allowed in our schools. I am hopeful that 2023, 2024 will be the year that we as a community take a stand against approving any additional pornographic material for our schools. It was very sad to hear the testimonies of parents in previous board meetings talk about teachers who thought it was appropriate to distribute sexual materials. My question to the board is why would they think that that is acceptable? Our community is concerned about the increasing sexualization of our students particularly as it's being pushed to lower and lower grades. I'm gonna ask each of you, have any of you researched the effects of pornography on children? And does anyone think that pornography is helping the mental health of our students? I wanna remind everybody that pornography is used to train and desensitize people and increase demand for human sex trafficking. Does anybody know anyone who's ever been a victim of human trafficking? And do you know that Arizona is home to the largest human sex trafficking recovery program and that we are taking elementary age children into the program? I wanted to highlight this for the board and ask each of you to consider if increasing sexualization of material is helping to protect our students. And do we think that continuing to add approved pornographic material that sexualizes children is something we should keep doing in our district or are we doing our teachers and students a disservice by allowing this to continue? What if, what if the Paradise Valley School Board was known for putting an end to pornographic material being approved in schools? What if we could trust the board to no longer allow this in our schools? What if each of you drew a line in the sand and said no more pornographic material on our watch? I would encourage you to give this serious thought as you review material to approve this year and the coming years that you serve our district. Thank you. Gilbert Para, Para. Been in one of these before. Um, my concern is, uh, my, my daughter goes to, well, my name's Gilbert Parra. I, I'm, a, I'm a Campo Bello dad. Um, my daughter's uh, in second grade. She goes to Campo Bello. And uh, she got suspended off the bus last week. Um, and that that's kind of unacceptable for us because my wife and I, we work paycheck to paycheck. So we, we don't have a liberty to going in late, getting out early just to pick my, our daughter up. And my concern is uh, there needs to be adult monitors on that bus. I I got with uh, Laura, Mrs. Laura Horbein, and and I requested a video because I wanted to see for myself what my daughter was doing so bad on the bus for her to get suspended for a week. And um, it was an eye opener for me. Um, it wasn't just her; it was her friend. It was a whole bus full of kids just acting up um, and I see the frustration on the on the bus driver and it's it's just appalling it was a really disturbing video um, he can't I, I just can't see how he he is uh, asked to uh, multitask driving a bus during busy traffic times and supervising kids in the back and they're going. I mean, I mean, they're kids. That's their job. Their their job is to be kids. And I and, and I'm just asking that y'all hear hear my cry, that um that there needs to be an adult monitor on that bus. 
for, for their safety. And that's, that's pretty much all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda is Dr. Bells. Thank you, President Case, members of the public cabinet, guests, we're happy to have you here tonight. And I am excited as we finish this year strong and together. You know, in PV schools, uh, I keep saying this as a part of our mission moment. I talk about our mission frequently. And then we it, it goes like this. We engage, we inspire, and nurture students through high-quality instruction, meaningful educational opportunities, and dynamic learning experiences. This guides us in our daily work. It needs to. And so that's why I say it frequently. And one of those experiences are nursing assistant program. PB School's dedication to providing quality education to students goes beyond the classroom walls. Earlier this month, some of Paradise Valley High School's CTE students earned their certification as nursing assistants, CNAs, after participating in a very, very rigorous test. The stu students spent countless hours preparing for this exam, which was made up of a written and uh, written and skills a portion. After hours of studying, tutoring, and support from parents, students, and staff alike, PV's nursing assistant program achieved a 100% passing rate. Congratulations. This is an amazing feat, and we are so proud of the students who earned this certification. Uh, these upcoming medical professionals will no doubt make a positive difference in the healthcare field. Paradise Valley High School's esteemed band director, Ryan Diefendorfer. Did I say that right? Diefendorfer. All right. Ryan, are you here? He's not. Um, but I, I, I know we'll share with him some of these words, right, Mr. Dennis? Uh, he's been announced as a quarter finalist for the prestigious 2024 Music Educator Award presented by the Recording Academy and Grammy Museum. With over 2,000 submissions being submitted as a quarter finalist is an exceptional accomplishment. Uh, Ryan has proven his dedication to his students and passion for music education, and it has not gone unnoticed. PB Schools wishes Ryan the best of luck as he continues on his journey towards winning the prestigious Music Educator Award. Congratulations. So we are winding down the year and the 22-23 school year is coming close to an end. We're only a week away from sending our 2023 graduates off to their next endeavor. And it's certainly been a year of accomplishment, including athletics, as you saw earlier this evening, academics, uh, the arts, and more. There truly is a journey of excellence for every child. And this year, students in paradise really shined. Congratulations, graduates, on completing this educational milestone. Whether your path is college, career, military, or community, on behalf of the governing board and all the employees of PB schools, we wish you all the very best on your next chapter. I'd also like to take this opportunity to send my congratulations and thanks to the parents of these graduates, one of them sitting here tonight. Um, and we are very grateful for your choice. Thank you for choosing PV schools. We are really excited to see the next step in their journey as adults. I'd also like to take the opportunity to extend a special thank you to Mr. Andre Long. Uh, Andre is uh, resigning from our district at the end of this year after having served just four years with us. He's a retiree out of Clark County where he spent 30 years, but he came to us and has served with excellence. I appreciate his passion, his expertise, his commitment to all kids. I have developed a friendship that I hope lasts well beyond his tenure here. And on behalf of PB Schools, I wanna say thank you for making a difference. Mr. Long. And lastly, if reading email and newsletters is not your thing, check out next week's final edition of 
our new podcast, PV Beat. Catch up on the first episodes by visiting Apple or Spotify podcasts and searching for PV Beat. You can also find the podcast uh, by first visiting pvschools.net. Uh, this show released uh, every other Wednesday is a fantastic way to hear the latest news and information coming out of paradise. There may even be a bonus summer edition, so stay tuned. Our team is excited to get season two kicked off at the beginning of next year. As we venture off into the last week of school and into summer, make sure that you stay connected with the Paradise Valley community by following your school and our district on Facebook. You can also find PV Schools on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube by searching at PV Schools. Likes, comments, and shares really do have an impact on sharing the amazing things that our students and staff accomplish. This is Paradise. Have a great rest of the 22-23 school year. Take time to enjoy summer uh, with your summer break with friends and family, um, and be safe and well. Thank you. Next on the agenda is items for approval. Dr. Bells. Thank you, President Case, Governing Board members, Cabinet, and guests. And tonight, we present for approval recommendations for seven candidates in new leadership roles. Or maybe six. <laughs> okay, <laughs> six, seven. <laughs> we had a nice group up here tonight. For yes, me, yes, me. yes. Dr. Holmes, would you please uh, run us through that list? Thank you, Dr. Bales. Uh, Madam President, members of the board, uh, Ashley McClelland is currently the administrative intern at Eagle Ridge Elementary School. She earned her Bachelor of Music degree in music education from the University of Redlands and a Master of Arts degree in Educational Leadership from NAU. If approved, she will receive salary and benefits in accordance with the PVP bargaining agreement. We recommend you approve Ms. McClellan to be the next principal at Eagle Ridge Elementary School. Oh, they have to approve her? They Wait gotta approve her first. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> May I have a motion to approve the recommendation to hire Ashley? McClellan for the position of principal at Eagle Ridge Elementary School as presented. So moved. Any board member wishing to make a comment? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion passes. Congratulations, Ms. McClellan. Do you do you have family here that you'd like to introduce? <clears throat> Welcome to this position. That is fabulous. Now that everybody knows when to apply, Sean Varner is currently the principal at Cooley Middle, uh, Cooley Middle School in the Higley Unified School District. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree in secondary education from NAU and his Master of Arts degree in curriculum instruction uh, for also from NAU. Uh, if approved, he will receive salary and benefits in accordance with the PVP bargaining agreement. We recommend you approve Mr. Varner to be the next principal at Sandpiper Elementary School. May I have a motion to approve the recommendation to hire Sean Varner for the position of Sam Piper Elementary School as presented? So moved. All those, in, uh, any board members wishing to make a comment? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion passes unanimously. Congratulations, Mr. Varner. <clears throat> Congratulations. Do you have family you'd like to introduce? We have my wife, Noelle, and my daughter, Shelby, and Leah Knavely is currently the assistant principal at Desert Shadows Middle School. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree in business from ASU because her parents cared about her education. <laughs> Go Devils. <laughs> a Master of Arts degree in multi Multicultural Education from NAU and a Master of Arts degree in Educational Leadership also from NAU. If approved, she will receive salary and benefits in accordance with the PVP bargaining agreement. We recommend you approve Ms. Knavely to be the next principal at Desert Shadows Middle School. 
May I have a motion to approve the recommendation to hire Leah Knabley for the position of Desert Shadows Middle School as presented? So moved. Any board member wishing to make a comment? I don't know how we can top Dr. Holmes, but, <laughs> <laughs> but what can we say? Just get to the vote. Come on. <laughs> oh, I am so excited about yep. this coming forward. Okay. So all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion passes. Congratulations, Ms. Canable. Do you have family you'd like to introduce? Thank you. She was definitely raised up in TV. Okay. Um, Heidi next. Wright is currently the assistant principal at Alhambra High School in the Phoenix Union District. Uh, she earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in Interdisciplinary Studies from ASU, a Master of Arts degree in Secondary Education, uh, also from ASU, and a Master of Arts in Educational Administration from GCU. If approved, she will receive salary and benefits in accordance with the PVP bargaining agreement, and we recommend you approve Ms. Wright to be the next principal at Vista Verde Middle School. May I have a motion to approve the recommendation to hire Heidi Wright for the position of Versti Vista Verde Middle School as presented. So moved. Any board member wishing to make a comment? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any, all those opposed say nay. Motion passes Congratulations, Ms. Wright. Congratulations. <clears throat> Do you have family you'd like to introduce? Congratulations. Kathleen Loker is currently an assistant principal at Maryvale High, uh, Maryvale High School in the Phoenix Union School District. Uh, she earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in International Relations from the University of Puget Sound and her Master of Education. In, I know that sounds impressive, right? I think it is. Uh, and uh, her Master of Education in Educational Leadership from ASU. If approved, she will receive salary and benefits in accordance with the PVP bargaining agreement. We recommend you approve Ms. Loker to be the next principal at North Canyon High School. May I have a motion to approve the recommendation to hire Kathleen Loker for the position of North Canyon High School as presented? So moved. Any board members wishing to make a comment? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion passes unanimously. Congratulations, Ms. Loker. Congratulations. Do you have family you'd like to introduce? Okay, last but not least, uh, Jessica Harrington is currently the principal and district testing coordinator at Riverside Elementary School District number two. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree in early childhood education from Ursuline College in Ohio and her Master of Arts degree in educational administration from GCU. If approved, she will receive salary and benefits in accordance with the COA bargaining agreement. And we recommend you approve Ms. Harrington to be the next director of assessment. May I have a motion to approve the recommendation to hire Jessica Harrington for the position of Director of Assessment as presented? So moved. Any board member wishing to make a comment? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion passes. Congratulations, Ms. Harrington. Congratulations. Do you have family you'd like to introduce? Mom, 
<laughs> Congratulations. Welcome. We're excited to have you here. Thank you so much. Next on the agenda, Dr. Bells. Thank you, President Keyes, Governing Board Members, Cabinet, and guests. Aaron, if I can have you turn on the presentation for me. <laughs> Tonight, we present for approval. I think I'll wait just a second. President Case, County Board Members, Cabinet, and guests. And tonight, we present for approval a recommendation to adopt resolution number 536, ordering and calling a special bond election to be held in and for the district and authorizing the Assistant Superintendent of Business, Sur Business Operations to comply with certain sections of the Internal Revenue Service. As you may recall, we presented for discussion on this topic two weeks ago. I have the presentation available, all 40 slides that we can go through if you would like, or any or a part of it again. I'd like to point out that we added one slide. Aaron, if you could show slide 38. This is the only slide that's new from the last presentation two weeks ago. Uh, I know that a couple of you asked about costs. The bond election does cost, and it's an M&O expense. And per question, the Maricopa County School Superintendent charges about $500. Arizona Republic uh, notification, we have to use the paper. Uh, that's approximately $750. Maricopa County elections takes a fee as well. That's estimated between $350 and $355,000 or $2.12 for a registered PVC voter. Translation services, about $1,500. Election pamphlet printing, uh, $41,000. U.S. Postmaster fee, uh, $26,000. And of course, as I started with, all of these election costs um, are M&O expenses. The committee uh, members uh, voted unanimously uh, for recommending the $340 million bond to go to the ballot this November, as we said last time that we would be here uh, with a recommendation. Um, after um, all things considered, I just wanted to touch on some of the key points that I'd like to reiterate. Uh, there is no tax, uh, there is no increase to the tax rate in this number. Uh, the increased costs are due to inflation. It covers uh, much of the same scope that our last bond did in 2019. This covers planning for projects over the next four to five years. Uh, if we don't need it, we won't spend it. For example, uh, we do have in the bond a new elementary school, middle school, and possibly an elementary rebuild, but we have to watch enrollment. We have to watch our land sales, the economy, developments in the north, and yet at the same time, we are carefully examining our facilities usage and boundaries with a committee now through the fall. And in the end, if we don't need it, we won't spend it. What is included uh, in this is interior, exterior, painting, flooring, concrete, lighting upgrades, roofing, asphalt, sports courts, emergency power upgrades, kitchen, security access, plumbing, uh, restrooms, just to name a few. Uh, it is focused on replace, repair, and refresh. And so with that, we do recommend approval, um, and we would need a roll call vote. We're happy to answer any questions. We do have our bond attorney here, uh, and we will do our best to answer all your questions if you have any. Um, we have a public comment card on this, Eddie Jackson.
followed by John Hassett. Good evening, Eddie Jackson. I just wanted to go over a few numbers. Um, in 2019, Paradise Valley USD voters approved a $236.1 million bond. That same year, Deer Valley USD, a larger district to the west, approved a smaller bond of $175 million. Now PVUSD is proposing a $340 million bond, a 44% increase with declining enrollment. Um, if you look at our enrollment numbers in 2019 on that $236 million bond, we were at roughly 29,760 students. We often hear about revenue per pupil spending, but we don't often talk about bond per pupil funding. That bond per pupil funding would was $7,930 per pupil. This uh, bond recommendation with just under 27,000 students would be $12,000 $592 per pupil in bond funding. That's an increase of almost $5,000 per pupil. And uh, in Deer Valley in 2019, with their 175 million, they had 32,583 students. That would have what was a $5,371 per pupil in bond funding. The point being, this bond is too rich. We need a bond, but we don't need $340 million in bond. So I encourage you guys to pass a lower bond on to the voters and let them decide. Thank you. Next, um, John Hassett. Good evening. Uh, I'll keep it short. He covered everything a lot better than I could have. But uh, one thing I did want to add is that with the declining enrollment and a lot of building, buildings being closed, I, don't, I know other buildings need maintenance, but they're going to be sitting idle and there's an opportunity from gaining revenue from those and that could be used for the other buildings. So I don't understand why they're going to sit around, make no money, and then they're gonna, we're going to take additional money to maintain those buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Um, may I have a motion to adopt resolution number 536, ordering and calling a special bond election to be held in and for the district and authorizing the assistant superintendent of business, business operations to comply with certain sections of the Internal Revenue Service? So moved. Any board member wishing to make a comment? Go ahead, Mrs. Christensen. I would like some clarification on the gender neutral restroom renovation um, discussion that we had last time. I um, we we discussed restrooms ex ex existing male thirty two, existing female seventeen, renovated gender neutral twenty nine. Does that mean that we're going to have just twenty nine to replace all these restrooms, or can you? provide some clarification on that. Thank you, President Case, Mrs. Christensen, governing board members, cabinet and guests. Uh, the discussion uh, last time provided a, an example. Um, and so that was just while it was meant to be. Uh, what our takeaway was from that discussion was a um, board interest in moving forward. And so at the secondary level, because our that was our conversation and recommendations that when we look at restroom renovations in the next bond, that we look at the secondary schools such as high school first. Uh, and when we have uh, plans to renovate those restrooms that we we look for every opportunity to to do so under the general neutral examples. Um, and of course, it varies from campus to campus uh, because of the footprint and what's available, but that would be our goal moving forward in the next uh, bond in terms of restroom renovations at the high schools. Um, I, I would like to thank you for the clarification also on the, um, I think in the past we have indicated that it would not be an increase to 
taxpayers, but it, it kind of depends on on um, the your tax bracket, your the tax percent. Excuse me, I, I understand that the tax percentage will not increase, but in some cases, depending on your home values, it, it is an increase in taxes to some. And I know that our just you know our district is hurting some of the people in our district when I walked around um, last year to meet with our constituents. Many of the people in my own neighborhood had increasing um, building, the, the property values on their homes were increased, but they were retired, many of them, and they, you know, they, they live um, on a very fixed income. And it would be nice to, to, I know our taxpayers have been so generous in the past, but it would ni be nice to have um, them have a tax decrease at some point. It, it seems that we continuously pass these bonds and overrides and it and they never cease. And I know that they're always fixed amounts, but then it goes on and on and on. And so um, I would just like to hear from other board members to get their input because it, you know, I think we should, we owe the taxpayers a discussion on this and not just rubber stamp things that come through. So I would like to hear, because I value your opinions and I would like to hear um, how you feel about this. I'd like to make a comment. Um, my husband owns a construction company and the cost of construction has skyrocketed. It just has. I mean, and you have to put in advance, way advance, if you want to get any cement, because that silicone plant on the other, on the west side of town, you can't get cement and because they're taking it all in the valley. But so that makes the cost go up and everything else, the cost has gone up. If you've gone to buy lumber lately, the cost has gone up. So part of the cost of this bond is because prices have gone up. Recently, I was inside a school and the teacher was very diligently packing up the classroom. I said, what's going on? She goes, well, we're going to be painted, paint, being, we're going to be painted. And so I have to pack everything up. And I went, oh my goodness, that's so much work. And she goes, oh no, it's worth it. We're going to get new carpet. We're going to get paint and it is going to be great. I thought, okay, here's a teacher going through all this extra work because she sees the benefit of keeping the school looking nice. And that's what we do. We keep our schools doesn't matter what school you're in, we're going to keep the schools looking nice in the wealthier areas, in the poorer areas. We treat the students with dignity, so they have a dignified place to go to school. But there is a cost increase in construction. The tax rate is staying the same. It is not increasing. Yes, I know house values have increased, and I've lived in the same house for 38 years, and it's it's changed and changed and changed. I understand that. But um, I think the value that we place on making our schools, and, and it also pays, you have to remember this, it pays for all the computers our kids have. And it pays for the, uh, what is that called? The maintenance, not to maintain the computers if something breaks on it. We have to pay for that. And that comes out of the bond. There's many, many things that come out of the bond. And we have as much like air conditioning and everything else so that we don't have to take it out of m and so that we can give the teachers as much as we possibly can. And I have always appreciated the generosity of our voters that see the value of education. So any other comments? Mr. Well, sure. Um, with regarding to rubber stamping things, I've never rubber stamped anything. You know, before every board meeting, I go through hours and hours of reading and um, going over every document, uh, all the paperwork we get ahead of time. I ask my questions to the cabinet when it's appropriate. So when I come to the board, um, my questions have been answered. I'm ready to, to vote yay or nay on it, whatever it might be. So when you refer to rubber stamping, um, that doesn't happen with me. Just let's get that out of the way. As far as fixed income, I'm on a fixed income. Okay, I've lived in this district all my life. You know, I've, I've retired and I'm on a fixed income. Yet I know the value of my property is going to be more if we have healthy school system. All right, the, the, the value of my neighborhood and my lifestyle here in this district will be better because the schools are well maintained. They look good. They're safe. And um, 
this brings people to our district. This brings students to our district when our buildings are in, in well, well, you know, well put together and, and maintained. Um, as far as house values and how much your tax is going to go up, if the bond didn't pass, those people whose property values are going up, their property, they're still going to pay more taxes. It's going to go up either way. All right. So um, that's 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 not they're not going to go down. And if, uh, you want to be a penny wise or dollar foolish, then oh yeah, vote against it. But um, you really need to invest in your neighborhoods, in your community, and this is the price I'm willing to pay to do that. Thank you, Mrs. Greenberg. Yeah, I think actually Mr. Pantera said it quite well. Um, I don't have a lot to add. Um, I do want to comment on the rubber stamp comment. I don't rubber stamp anything either. Um, having sat on this board for quite a number of years, there have been times that questions have been brought before us and the board has absolutely said not the right time or, you know, can we rejigger it and look at it? Um, I feel we haven't, you know, we had a community committee put together, uh, did its due diligence. Um, we were offered quite a number of scenarios in our study session as to um, what a possible recommendation could be, you know, could be. I think the discussion last board meeting um, brought forth this recommendation. I think we are trying to watch out in terms of asking voters to approve something that will not raise the tax rate. We don't have any control over assessments. We just don't. Um, and so, whereas I think we're all cognizant of that, that's not under our control. What is under our control is the rate we, we you know, what we ask for and what that means in terms of a rate. So, um, you know, as has been said, um, having bonds approved does allow us to keep more money in MNO because we aren't having to take money out of MNO to repair it air conditioner or, you know, deal with carpeting or, um, you know, do any of the things we can do with the bond money. And, um, you know, and, and the reality is, is what we are doing here is being asked for our approval to put it on the ballot, and then it's up to our community. And if we don't put it on the ballot, then we, it's a definite no. So I feel that um, it is appropriate to ask our community and I hope that they will agree with us that it's needed. Any other comments, Mrs. Baker? Yeah, I have a comment and a question. Um, my question is, can we get some clarification on um, the tax rate? I, I believe I remember Ms. Berrigan say last week or two weeks ago that it is um, a certain amount of cents per $100,000. It's not a percentage. And so it does not, it's not, moving it's the same is that correct yes well that's how i understand it's so many so, so much per hold on thousand dollars so much per hundred thousand value. dollars not a percentage, percentage that might per, fluctuate the percentage won't if if you're if, if the value of your home goes up you know, then that home, might go up okay you know it's going to go up as the same percentage as it's always been it's, if this passes it's still going to be the same percentage Okay. Um, my comment is I have worked in a school district that could not get their bonds or their MNOs passed. And I worked in August, in September with broken air conditioners. I worked in December, in January with broken heaters. It is miserable and you still have to go to school. We are fortunate in our district that our bonds have passed. We have beautiful campuses from the south part of our district to the north part of our district. Our air conditioners get fixed, our heaters get fixed, our rooms get painted. The difference between a school district that passes these and a school district that doesn't is night and day. And when I walk around our campuses, I'm proud of them. They look nice, they're in repair, and that is what keeps kids in our district. It is the falling apart buildings. It is the moldy carpet. That's what keeps kids out of districts like that. And so. The bond, the over, the, it is so important to pass for teachers, for students, for property values, for the community. And so I am, I agree with what um, Mr. Greenberg, or Ms. Greenberg and Mr. Pantera have said. Any other comments? Mrs. Christensen? Yes. First of all, I just want to say that I'm thrilled we're having a discussion because that, um, I, I 
I really value the opinions of the other members on this board and, and it seems like we don't have enough discussions on very important decisions sometimes. And I, and I do, I spend a lot of time running through the numbers as well and doing my homework, doing my due diligence, but we don't get to discuss these items and three of us are new, fairly new board members. And so this is the time to have the, just these discussions because we can't do that before the be, before the board meetings before we meet and so that's that's what I'm that's what I'm um, wanting to do is just do have more of these discussions where um, we can you know agree or disagree but it just it's just so important to to understand all the aspects of some of the things that we're deciding up here and so um, I'm sorry if some have taken offense to the term rubber stamp. And so for that, I apologize, but I get a little bit frustrated when I would like to have discussions for a lot of different topics up here and, and we just vote and um, it's a little bit frustrating. So I'm really happy that you all are ha wanting to have a discussion with me about this because I, I, I'm trying to understand and I'm trying to understand the numbers, especially you know with, with our declining enrollment. Um, and I'm not well versed on, I know there's a motion on the floor right now to vote and maybe Dr. Bells can help me a little bit on how to um, suggest maybe we do an amendment to, and I don't remember exactly how to do this, but to maybe ask for a lower amount. Um, but we've had this discussion before when I- President yes, Case, can, Mrs. Christensen, yeah. um, I would recommend it. If you wanted to amend the motion, you would have to make a, um, and you'd have to make a motion to amend and, and put in a dollar amount. And then we would uh, ask for a second to that motion and we would then vote on that motion. If it's not second, it would die. Um, and then the remaining motion is still there, the original motion. So if you want to amend the $340 million recommendation, you have to move to amend that and pick a number. Um, have you looked again at, he didn't, Dr. Bells didn't go through the whole slideshow. Did you look at, I don't know which slide it is, probably seven or six. It says scenarios. Did you see that again? Um, the committee went through all the different amounts and there were zero people wanting the 295 and million and there were 16 who wanted the 340 and the 375 there were 12 and the 430 there were five and so they went through i i just was looking through this again and something in this in the 340 million this is what the committee came up with the major Majority facility needs assessment is 241,000. The major technology needs assessment is 50,000. The full transportation needs assessment is 8 million. I'm rounding some of these numbers. The scaled down furniture and equipment needs assessment is 16, 16 million. And there was a higher amount in the 375. There's full security and front door of school beautification is 24 million. Recently, I was in the Horizon lobby, and it was so nice. With security measures, it's very hard to make a school inviting and to not make it look like you're going into bulletproof glass and security and doors that lock. It's very hard, and it was so inviting and beautiful. And I just appreciated that so much, but it costs money. Nothing is free. And so... I appreciate what our schools have done to make the lobbies look nice and and have the security with around and in, in the lobby, but it costs a lot of money. And so some of this is for that. So and the 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 facility needs assessment, that's for parking lots, that's for maintaining all kinds of things. Like I just said, the painting and the carpeting of a school I was in. So any other comments on any of this, board members? Yes. Go ahead, um, Mrs. Christensen. We also have a budget from the state and the, the state passed their budget and, and we are going to be getting additional funds coming to our district from the state of Arizona. 
and I would like us to I would like to, us to be a little bit more cognizant with um, just more fiscally responsible with some of the expenditures that that we're currently doing. I, I know that um, Dr. Bells and I have had several conversations on this topic, and um, I just would like to show the voters that we really we do really appreciate. The, the funds that they give us and we're willing to do things like maybe cut back on travel expense expenditures and things of that nature. Um, I'm the clerk this quarter and I some of the things that I just see come through is, is to me is not essential, but you know I'm I'm not I'm not one of the cabinet members that that um, approved these expenses um, and understand where all the money is coming from. So it, it's just, to me, it's it's a little bit um, daunting to see the amount, the dollar amounts that come through a, a large district like this. And I, and I do understand, I'm a new board member and I'm trying to learn. I, I do a lot of homework and I do ask a lot of questions, but um, I would just like us to, to um, appreciate the taxpayers in a way that maybe can give them a little bit of a, Le lessen their tax burden um, for what they offer our district. Any other comments? Um, uh, there was a comment made by a committee member the last board meeting who sat through all of those meetings. And I appreciate his comments. He's a very fiscal responsible type of citizen in our district. And when and I was really interested to know what he had to say. And he was very supportive of it. And I appreciate that. And um and he went through in great detail. He also has has more of a finance mind than I do. And I try really hard to understand things. I just know that I want our district to have what they need to have these kids have the best chance they can to succeed. And I don't want money to be wasted in any shape or form. I have been checking money for years and years and years. I've been a pain in the neck. I get it. See, he's smiling. He knows I've been a pain in the neck. So I try really hard to be fiscally responsible. I feel like I'm responsible to the voters, but those who sat on the committee went through, and, and, it, and it doesn't take five months to do that committee. It takes years for the assessment, but I'm telling you, construction costs have gone up. So a lot of that increase is due to in construction and cost, or just computers. Everything has gone up, and it's just a very hard thing to spend less money when everything costs more. And, and I do appreciate the the committees. Uh, they do do a lot of work, but um, I've been reviewing all the ARS 15 um, statutes. And as I look and see the responsibilities of a board member, I'm an elected official as we all are. And it is our responsibility to approve these payments. It's it's, And I appreciate the work that the committees are doing, but it is ultimately up to the board. It is our responsibility to do this. And um, I don't get to go to these committee meetings. I, there's a lot of committees that come through our district and we don't get to hear. And so for me, I'm a very detail oriented person and not hearing all of the discussions behind the scene, I, um, I have a hard time just accepting here, here's the choices. I want to know why. I want, I want to see if there's any way that we could, um, we can possibly save our taxpayers some more money. And, and I would like to, and I'm probably going to do this wrong, but I make a motion to just um, maybe vote on scenario six, which is a, a lesser amount to our taxpayers. Um, scenario on page which states um, 200 million and yeah I was looking at 
So, President Case, uh, Mrs. Christensen, the, the scenario six was a slide last presentation. Aaron, if you can pull up the slide, please, uh, at the beginning, I'll just thumb through it. Thank you. This is the slide that you're referring to, and this number six that you're referring to was not a presentation, a recommendation that we brought for discussion last time. The committee had narrowed it to the top three um, because there was no one interested in uh, scenario number six. Uh, this would be uh, two different bond uh, elections, so the bond election costs would be in each of the years necessary uh, under that scenario. And so um, that would be an m &O expense, of course, but we did not present on six. Uh, if you are interested, Mrs. Christensen, in a dollar amount lesser than $340 million, then you can make a motion to amend the recommendation at X number. And then Mrs. Case will ask for a second. If, if you look at scenario six, there's 200 million in 2023 and then 200 million in 2025, that equals 400 million, which is more than the amount in scenario three, which is 340 million. So it splits it up, but adds it up more. I would like to make a motion to, to look at a smaller dollar amount uh, of 295 million in the election for next year. So 2023, right? Is it 2024 the election or 2023? It's for 23. Is there a second for this scenario? The motion fails because there wasn't a second. So are there any other comments? Yes. I just wanted to add that um, one of our responsibilities as board members is also to act in the best interest of our district and our students. And I think a bond that supports um, all of these things that we needed to is in the best interest. and. That is also one of our duties as a board member. Um, Mrs. Christensen, you made an allusion to this, the state budget being passed and that there would be some money there. I, I think that's what you were allu alluding to, facilities and things. Is that what you were alluding to? Am I correct? This is a case, Mrs. Christensen, governing board members, just as maybe a little additional clarification, the budget that was signed by the governor um, included an increase to the uh, district uh, additional assistance, DAA. Uh, we don't have that final calculation, but it's probably around $2 million. Right. That's what I was going to say. It's very little. And then tr trying to get a hold, and then there's the facilities money that we, I have known the finance people in our district to go after any money they could for facilities as often as they could. So we're very cognizant of not overreaching and spending things for, for our constituents. And so any extra funding that we can get for facilities, we get it because we want to uh, have our students have the best opportunities. So I don't know if that answered anything you brought up earlier. No, I would I would just like to see us be a little bit more fiscally responsible, get get dollars in the classroom. Um, as as clerk this quarter, I've been just seeing a lot of different expenditures. Like I mentioned before, the the travel and businesses now are just we're trying to decrease travel, and it, it seems like there's some expenditures within this district that are maybe excessive and so i'm just trying to 
to ensure that we, when we spend our taxpayer dollars, that we are fiscally responsible. And um, I don't have any further comments on this topic. Let me just respond to that. I have been watching the vouchers for years and years and years. And it took me a long time to understand that if a student government pays for something, it comes out of the funds they're spending, but it has to go through the district. And so a lot of the things we're approving are not coming out of district monies. They're coming out of student funding. And it's hard to tell when you look through that what's what, but that really helps. And, and, look, and as far as travel goes, from compared from 10, 15 years ago, our travel is so small compared to what it used to be. And we are very careful in our money in traveling. I talked to Dr. Bills specifically about travel and we are so careful that we only do what is necessary for what is best for our students. So I just, I, I, that is something I've watched carefully through the years, but so many times there are expenses that have to go through the system that really aren't expenses to the district, but because of finance laws, it has to go through that process. Thank you, Ms. President Case. I do understand that. I look at the um, Auditor General's chart of accounts when I'm going through all these. That's why it takes me so long to go through all the expenditures. I'm not talking about the funds that go through for the, for the children. I'm talking about some of the other expenditures, travel expenditures um, that are excessive. I, I think the word is excessive is wrong, but we'll skip that. We have it on the board. We have a, a something um, right now that has been moved and we're ready to take a vote. May we have our roll call vote, please? Thank you. Mrs. Baker? Aye. Mrs. Greenberg? Aye. Mrs. Christensen? Abstain. Mrs. Case? Aye. Mr. Pantera? Aye. Motion passions with four ayes and one abstention. Next on the agenda, Dr. Bells. Thank you, President Case, Governing Members, Cabinet, and guests. Uh, tonight, uh, we would present for approval resolution number 534, a public traffic control easement with the city of Phoenix for a traffic control easement at 40th Street adjacent to Paradise Valley High School as presented. The city of Phoenix is requesting a new permanent traffic control easement to replace the current existing Hawk light uh, there on 40th Street, uh, just east of the campus and north of Bell Road uh, for the construction cost of $1. Uh, the city of Phoenix will be replacing the old Hawk light system um, with a new modern Hawk light system. The easement uh, does not require anything from PVUSD with the exception of 100 square feet of the corner property next to the tennis courts and North Bus Drive. And we do recommend approval. May I have a motion to approve? Uh for the approval of resolution 534, a public traffic control easement with the city of Phoenix for a traffic control easement at 40th Street adjacent to Paradise Valley High School as presented. So moved. Um, any comments? I don't think you said this, Dr. Bells. Did you say it's going to be like the one by Horizon High School? Uh, it may or may not be. I, I don't know exactly. Uh, but it, ser it's serves an upgrade, a upgrade. Uh, it, 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 it serves a function. It serves the same purpose. There is currently one there. It was way before we did the one at Horizon. Um, but because of its location, they're upgrading it. Um, okay. So I don't believe there's going to be a median, but um, I don't have that drawing. Okay. So it, it might not be like the one at Horizon, but it say, serves the same purpose. Absolutely. And, and we're, the reason we're doing it is to update it and for the safety of the students crossing 40th Street because we want them to be safe. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Next on the agenda is consideration and approval of issues for the Arizona School Boards Association Leg Legislative Committee Consideration 2024 agenda. Um, public comment. 
this would be sorry sorry housekeeping i've gotten com confused with my abc's okay um so at the may 4th meeting each of us had an opportunity to individually share our top five priorities and and or additional items for consideration. And those recommendations are highlighted in green and listed on your handout. I will read each one aloud and we can discuss to come up with a list of the top five priorities with the rationale and the top two additional items and the rationale that benefits the collective will of the board to submit for consideration. Okay, may I have a motion to submit the following issues for the Arizona School Boards Association Legislative Committee consideration, the 2024 political agenda as discussed to direct our board secretary, Deanne Chisman, to submit these on behalf of the board. So moved. Thank you. Now, now is when we're going to go through all this. What's that? I know. Any comments of help? Feel free. <laughs> We've done this many times. Okay. Um, so we have five to offer and we have them in green. Um, I have a question. Yes. I'm sorry. You know, these are the ones we came up with last meeting. Right. Were some of the ones that are highlighted ones that more than one of us had brought up. Right. So maybe they should be highlighted separately. The one when only when maybe one of us had highlighted that might save us some time. Okay. Um, we, I tried to keep track of that. And so like number one, maximum state funding, there were two on that. And there were two on amend the constitutional aggregate expenditure. There were two on that. There were three on eliminate unfunded mandates and administrative burdens. Mm -hmm. So there's two, three. There were three on established financial and academic transparency for all institutions and individuals that ex accept public funds. There were three on that. So if you want to, to save time, we could do those four, and then we have a fifth one we could do. Yeah, because if those got the most of, most of us already agreeing on, then, then that okay. might be Okay, so that would be maximizing state funding that first one, and the next one would be amend the constitutional aggregate expenditure limit to reflect current education funding levels and priorities via legislative referral to the voters. That would be a second one. And then there were three on eliminate unfunded mandates and administrative burdens. Tony, thank you for this idea. I don't want to spend a lot of time. And then the fourth one would be establish financial and academic transparency for all institutions and individuals that ex accept public funds. I like that. Does anybody else have another comment of what we should add? Because we have onesie twosies all over that. Look on the second page. I wouldn't mind if we did because the American, the Native Americans want to increase the compulsory attendance age from 16 to 18 years or the attainment of a high school diploma or GED before the age of 18. They have requested that for years, and I wouldn't mind having that be our fifth one, but I don't know what you guys want. Uh, I'm done with that. I'm for that. Where is that, though? I'm trying to find on the paper. It's on improve outcomes for all students, the top. They, they've just requested that, and I wouldn't mind having that, just because they know their communities. I want all kids to graduate from high school or get the GED. And it doesn't say you have to go to school till you're 18. It just says to graduate. So it's not making everybody go to school longer. It's just saying to keep going until you get your degree, until you're 18. Or you, But you can graduate when you're 14 if you have the degree credits. May I make a comment? Yes. So I didn't see anything in here about academic achievement and test That's, scores. Uh, I'm going to include those on the last. Okay. Because we can we add some more. We were only looking at the ones that we... In, in the body we, of it. And then right? we can do the other ones. Is that okay? I'm going to come to those next. Yeah. 
Okay. Does anybody have a different one they'd rather have than that one? Anne. Excuse me, Mrs. Greenberg. Sure. Um, I mean, I like that one. I know why it's there. It's not just the the districts on Native American lands. It's, oh, it's many me. districts. It's that, many districts, that right? I've asked for that. Um, Thank you for that correction. No, no, it's it's not a correction. It's it's. it's they started it, and other people have an joined enhancement. It. Um, I I I think that I think everything we have here <laughs> makes sense. Um, I still kind of go back to the revise the school finance formula because the school finance formula needs revision. So which one is that's that? the second one um, oh, under adequately and equitably fund school districts to at least the national median per pupil funding. Uh, so I, I still kind of like that one. Which one is the one and I can't remember that gets rid of the that they have to vote every year or we're going to have a close down the schools. Well, that's the AEL, which we've already. Oh, okay. yeah, right. yeah. Okay. We've already. Okay. Um, we've already done that one. Suggested okay. that as a priority. Oh yeah. That's that one. Okay. Excuse me. Aggregate expenditure. That's the word I was looking for. Okay. Um, you know, everything they do is trying to do that. And I know that's the general purpose. I get what you're saying there, Ann. I don't care. I'll go either way you want. I mean, I, I I think everything they do is trying to do that. And the other one is a specific one. So if we want to do a specific or a general one. So I don't know. What do, what do the other members feel? Mrs. Baker, do you have any comment on that? On whether we do the, the, the 16 to 18 year old or oh. do the a revise the school finance formula too. I would lean towards the revising the school. Okay. Formula. Okay. How about Mr. Well, I am, I do like the idea that, cause that would improve the outcomes for our students if they're staying, stay in school longer. You know, um, we have students leaving because of work and that, and they can, they just leave or, um, I've seen that happen over and over again, uh, by the, as far as graduate graduation rates go. Um, but the other one, see, the problem with me is everything on this list I'm for. Yeah. So how do I separate it out? Okay. Well, you guys no, get to I'm decide. Trying, I'm, I'm still leaning towards the improved outcome, the, the, the compulsory attendance. Okay. Because we've got, we've got basically three things there in, in, in the uh, equitable funding area and nothing in any of the other. Uh, uh, Mrs. Christensen, do you want to be the tiebreaker on this? Well, I kind of have the opposite uh, issue as Tony because I don't think we should have a political agenda, and I don't, I don't really care for any of these. That's why I came up with my own three. So I don't know if okay, I'd be a so good you don't you don't want the those requesting the age to change. I don't care how old somebody is to graduate. I just want them to graduate, mm -hmm. whatever it takes. I don't know. Can we send in six? How can we just go on with it? Does it matter? What were they going to? If we send in six, what are they going to make? I don't know. Say that we didn't know how to read the instructions. Oh, okay. Well, does anybody want to drop a different one instead? Do four? Okay. Well, okay. We'll do, we'll not do the fourth and we'll just do four and send in the first four. Okay. Is I mean, that okay? We're just going to do four. We might as well. I mean, I'm fine with increasing the attendance. Age if that's what people are more leaning to, so we can have the five. Okay, so that's our that's our. It's better than leaving one blank. Okay, fifth. That's our fifth. Now moving on to the other. The audience is thinking they don't like us to have discussion at this point, folks. Okay. Um, then we can set in two other things below are the three additional priorities for consideration: um, increase academic achievement and the test scores. Prioritize dollars in the classroom, empower parents to direct the education and the upbringing of their children. I would especially like to do one and two myself. Anybody else have any comments? Can we, were we supposed to add in ones that we wanted to at the last meeting? I thought we were doing that this meeting. That's what, that's what this is. This is the meeting we're doing it in. So but, can uh, I add in ones that I would want? Okay. So if I was going to choose ones outside of this, it would be to fully fund special education and it would be um, protections for LGBTQ youth in schools.
Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else want to add anything or stay with what we have or what? Mrs. Greenberg? Well, I want to make a comment. Um, I think, you know, for example, increased academic achievement and test scores is something we all strive for. But the point of this agenda is to provide the ASBA government relations team direction so that when things are proposed to the legislature or they are talking to legislators, um, that they can go to specifics and, and you know what's happening in terms of actual bills. And I, I think when you look at um, you know increased academic achievement and test scores, that's that's the district level. I mean, what is it we would expect the legislature to do along those lines? Um, so I you know in terms of what we're suggesting as priorities, uh, you know keep in mind that this is what, what is it that we want the legislature to be doing? I know what you're saying, but my focus is always on academic achievement. Well, I understand that, but what is it you expect the legislature to I'm do? I'm not sure, but I'd like to have, the, to have the discussion. And I would go down and even testify as to ways I think it could be done. But do we want them making the choices for what's best for the test scores in our school district? I think that's what that comes down to, is what Ann's saying is it's like that is on the forefront of everyone's mind. That's why we're here. But that is a what we need to decide as a governing board, as opposed to what is being. I mean, I mean, those could include unfunded mandates if we're letting the legislature decide on how we're going to best improve academic achievement and test scores. I mean, I, you know, for example, the the compulsory, you know, increase the compulsory age. That ha that's undergone, ha having served on the legislative committee, having served as a delegate, I can tell you that's, as you know, that's a discussion that's been had. And there are many districts that don't feel that's something they want. That's not what they need to increase academic achievement and test scores. They've said, you know, they they basically have said, no, it's been in here because the majority of districts do think that's that's appropriate. But Again, as Mrs. Baker just said, you know, we do think what we feel is going to increase academic achievement and test scores in PV is not necessarily what Cave Creek is going to say or Deer Valley or, you know, fill in the blank with anybody, you know. And, and so if we are asking that of the legislature, then it does become a top-down overall. It's not necessarily going to allow us to individualize for our district. So I think if, if we want to do something, in, you know, if we want to say something about increased academic achievement, I think we need to be more specific about what it is we would expect from the legislature. Less global of a statement, a more specific of a particular, okay. I wouldn't mind the discussion still, but any other comments? It's just ironic that there are no statements of specifically about increasing that academic achievement because that, I mean, that that is one of the reasons why Arizona is um, ranked lowest in our nation with um, in test test scores, et cetera. And so I would like to maybe as a board come up with something that talks about academic achievement maybe wordsmith some of the ones that are on here rather than because I, I personally don't like the idea that we're even discussing and voting on a ASBA political agenda for 2024. Um, but if we could put something in there about raising academic outcomes, that I think that is the whole reason why our children are in school. Um, I can give you a specific one that could help with academic achievement. People talk about preschool things all the time. Uh, they could make it, the state of Arizona can make a deal with LeapFrog to have that available to every school, every child in Arizona. And that would help kids who are trying to learn English immediately. I give that, I give LeapFrogs to people constantly. Here, here's a CD. Go have your child learn the sounds. 
when they're three and four years old and their parents are Spanish speaking in the home and they don't know how to say the sounds in English. And so I do that all the time. I'd like our district to do that. But the state could make a deal where they have that available. And I know I have grandchildren in Utah and they have a preschool online program that my grandchildren have participated in that's fabulous. And it's 15 minutes every day. And if you don't do it every day and if you don't show up, then you're kicked out of the program. I mean, they 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 have accountability that you, and it's tremendously helped my grandchildren. So there are things we can do, we could say of that nature. When I said I have increased academic achievement and test scores, I have some ideas. I mean, this is my thing. <laughs> right. right, Yeah, and I agree with you. And, and one of the things on this is provide full-time funding for preschool programs in the K-12 formula. Mm -hmm. And that gets our preschoolers started. Right. But I don't even like the government to do that. I just want, I, I mean, you have to go. It means so like it, and, but I know, but I, my taxpayers are then pay for some other child to go to preschool. I get all that. But what I'm saying is it's an inexpensive way to do it, to put certain things online and we could have them create a preschool program that's free for kids in state of Arizona to sign up and learn. And one of those things could be phonics online. There's so many good things that could be done online, free to the kids, and that our districts could promote. So would that be okay to do that, something specific? That would make much more sense. That would make okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Make okay. So then that. let's say to, how do you want to say that? To uh, promote online preschool preparation programs. We, we can come up. We can wordsmith this better. But the, the state could have a program, and we could even say to look at Utah as how they do it. I mean, there are things that we can do that, that wouldn't cost a lot of money that could be done. Okay? Something to, yes? No, I was just going to say, given the language, um, it might be support an online pre-K preparation oh, perfect. program. Perfect. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Support an online preschool preparation program. I, I, my grandchildren have totally benefited from that. And I talk to Hispanic parents in stores all the time. And I, I tell them about it. I show them iPhone uh, uh, apps that help people. So that's just something we could do. So various preschool apps, et cetera, that's free to the public that they could use. That our schools then could say, and we could take the state and put it on our district and say, these are available. I would like our children to come to school in kindergarten being more prepared, and that would help them. Yeah. Okay. Not everybody so sends their thing. child to preschool. That doesn't. The what? Not everybody ch sends their child to preschool. And oh, I know. I know. I did mom taught preschool. I'm not saying that. But I could have used that as a mom as a resource. At home. That's, no, it's not a preschool. Not send them to a preschool. It is to have online materials by the state online that are available to all of our students in the state. And how will that help our test scores? Because when they get to school, they can learn to read sooner. If you don't know your ABCs when you get to school, you can't learn to read in kindergarten. I know that. So, sorry. When we talk about reading, that's my thing. Um, okay. We could, is, is that something we could go along with? Okay, and you, how did you say that, how you phrase that again, Ann? I just said support an online pre-K preparation program. Great, that's that's free or whatever. We just on, support it online. Okay, that's perfect. Okay, how about prioritize dollars in the classroom? That is something our district does, and I would like the state to recognize our achievement in that area. Anybody? I mean, not just to recognize ours, but I'd like them to always promote that in the state. Because we are one of the best in this uh, right. doing that, getting the money we have into the classroom. Right. I'm trying to think what kind of legislation that, would, that, that refers to. I, I think some of the um, points on the ASBA political agenda do prioritize funds. And I think that that's just, being maybe redundant because we could choose to um, provide dedicated school capital funding consistent with the constitutional requirement of a general and uniform public school system. 
We could ensure the formula addresses the unique financial needs of schools serving students in poverty and enroll at remote schools. That is all dollars in the classroom. I, I don't think anyone's priority is to not put dollars in the classroom. Right. But if you're thinking about money spent for administration or money spent on other areas, we work really hard to put money in the classroom. Oh, I agree. Our district does a fantastic right. job of that. I'm saying, well, I guess I'm saying two things. One, that's kind of part of something we could have chosen from ASBA, but also I, I feel like that is also a school district decision based on what's best for each individual district. And that- Right, but they can advertise how we're doing. I mean, the state can be a collector of information. Oh, absolutely, and but that's that not giving pressure. them direction on policy. Though. But the policy could be, you guys have to show every year throughout the but state. They do. And they do that. That's right. what the Auditor General report right. absolutely report. Does. does. So right. if if what you're saying is is more of a, you know, PR part of this, it's the PR I think it's part already I'm taken care of okay. via the Auditor okay. General report. Okay. Um, Fully fund special education is another one and empower parents to direct the education and upbringing of their children. Any comments? And protect LBGQT. I'm not sure how to say all that. Well, that one's also in the, uh, in the original, right? Support policies that protect school district employees and students from discrimination, including on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. That's also up there already. Thank you, Tony. I didn't see that. Okay. So... Do we want to just do put in one then uh, political? What we want to is to do the preschool because it's specific. I, I can get behind this, the preschool one all the way. Okay. Any other? I can also do the uh, um, protected sexual orientation one too. And that, but but they just said that's already in there. You okay. Just, they, we're looking for things that are specifically not in here. You're saying. Yeah, Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mrs. Christensen? I just, I don't like the preschool one at all. I, I really want to focus on elementary, middle, or high school. Our, the students that we have now, how do we increase academic achievement and test scores for that, for the groups that we have, not, not pre-K? Um, oh, well, the... Well, hopefully we'll get those students in our classrooms. And I'm telling you, that helps. That's what I'm trying to say. Yes, Mrs. Greenberg. Um, Dr. Bales or another member of cabinet, can you address the um, what perhaps um, promoting academic achievement or, or pre-K prep could do to support academic achievement for individuals who are students who would eventually be coming to our schools? President Case, uh, Mrs. Greenberg, governing board members, early childhood education has long been um, evidence-based uh, to improve student achievement when children come from uh, print-rich environments as a parent with young children. Uh, the more you read to them, the more you expose them to literature uh, and uh, and just having engaging conversation with them that exposes them to the signs on the street. Uh, and we have clear evidence that, you know, supporting uh, those early childhood programs such as Title I preschools, those kids have not come always from, you know, print-rich environments. And so by providing that to them, clearly they get a leg up and they come better prepared to kindergarten and they're ready to be readers by first grade. So I think the evidence has been supportive of that. I think Dr. Corson, maybe if you have any thoughts, you're our curriculum expert, you might be able to add some words of wisdom here too. Uh, President Case, uh, Dr. Bales, I would just echo what you have uh, stated, that there's significant research to indicate that um, preschool uh, education is vitally important, especially around literacy, to uh, prepare students to be successful in school and in life. And the more that we can provide that kind of head start into uh, school, into reading, uh, those students have shown to benefit uh, significantly from that. Well, since this was my bullet point, and I the one that suggested it, and I don't really like the pre-K, I will reword it and suggest um, how about free readiness for high schoolers to prepare for the ACT, since we are um, now testing with ACT, 
think it's what ninth and 11th graders are using, or is it just the 11th graders that are doing ACT? How about something like that, that would, because preschool is a long time to, before we, you know, I, I think it's great to plant those seeds, but. How about if we do both? <laughs> we could do both. How's that? A compromise. All right. And and anything we can do to help our kids with ACT is great in my book. And I have spent lots of money on kids buying books to prepare them for ACT and tutors, et cetera, to get them a leg up. So that's great. It might be something the legislature so a specific do. legislation item might be uh, that the leg legislature would have some bill that would provide funds to give people who can't afford it the necessary prep materials to study for the ACTs. Or or things All online that are available that we can then take the state platform and bring it into our district like and kids can do it. I like that. Okay. Okay, so now we have our two. Okay. Well, how are we wording this one? Oh, how are we going to word that? However you think is best, Anne. How's that? Well, now I'm, I'm, is the point, did you say, what is it? Support free to low cost readiness for... ACT prep is that yes provide yes. free readiness programs for right. ACT preparations for our high school students get them funding or somehow get them in their hands yeah, people like kids can't afford it or ACT families that can't afford AC, it. we can just say ACT testing because we know it's high school mm -hmm. so support free readiness uh, preparation programs for like ACT that. testing okay yeah sounds good Okay, so we have the ones that we have chosen and we ended up with five because so we didn't send in four and we've all made comments. So all those of, the, uh, of doing the five that we talked about and the last two, uh, all those in favor say aye. In, in the spirit of um, clarity, can we... Can somebody read, them? read them so that we know what we're voting oh, on? Yes. Okay. Please. Oh, yes. Well, she asked, as I said, I. I'm not sure. The first one is maximize state funding for competitive salaries to attract, recruit, and retain talented teachers and staff, including support for Arizona Teachers Academy and efforts to increase the diversity of the teaching workforce and for difficult to fill positions. Amend the constitutional aggregate expenditure limit to reflect current education funding levels and priorities via legislative referral to the voters. Eliminate unfunded mandates and administrative burdens. Increase the compulsory attendance age from 16 to 18 years or the attainment of high school diploma or GED before the age of 18. Establish financial and academic transparency for all institutions and individuals that accept public funds. Support an online pre-K preparation program. Support free readiness preparation programs for ACT testing. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion passes unanimously. Um, next on the agenda is consideration and approval of delegates to Arizona School Boards Association's 2023 Delegate Assembly County Meeting and the Annual Business Meeting. So, um, is there any board member wishing to make a nomination? I'd like to nominate myself for that. Okay. Any other wishing to make a nomination? How many do we send just one? We send one plus a alternate, don't we? Does the alternate attend? I'm not sure. Only if the... Okay. But I didn't know if, if it was just if the other one couldn't. Well, it depends. I mean, preferably yes, because literally if somebody has to leave... Uh, during the meeting, they, you know, hand off or, you know, even just bathroom break. 
Um, okay. They literally hand off the click. Okay. So we need to make two. So one to be the delegate and one to be the alternate delegate. Any nominations for alternate delegate? I'll, I'll, I'll nominate myself for the alternate. Okay. Delegate. Any other comments? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to suggest you, Anne. You were scooting in your seat downward. Okay. Any I, comment? I'm pleased to pass it on. <laughs> you want to pass this on, huh? Okay. So may I have a motion to appoint Tony Pantera <laughs> and Carrie Baker as the alternate delegate to represent the Paradise Valley Unified School District's governing board members at the Arizona School Boards Association 2023 Delegate Assembly County Meeting and at the annual business meeting. So moved. Any board members wishing to make a comment? Thank you both. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. You, if you vote nay, then you have to go. Okay, motion passes unanimously. Okay. Next on the agenda is gifts and donations. Boulder Creek Elementary School PTO donated to the school $7,900 for artificial turf. It's a outdoor reading space, which really got my attention. And then the Desert Shadows Elementary School PTA donated a Lou Interactive Playground worth $49,000 to Desert Shadows Elementary. That's a lot. And then at the uh, Echo Mountain Intermediate School, uh, the Rito Partners uh, donated to 11, 11, um, excuse me, $1,100 to stool, student incentive. The incentive is ice cream. You guys want to have a party? Okay. It's for their um, program there. Um, for ice cream, let's see. There are many donations. We appreciate all donations made to our school. You make such a difference. Uh, may I have a motion, please, to accept these donations? So moved. Any board me member wishing to make a comment? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion passes unanimously. Next on the agenda is items for discussion. Dr. Bells. Thank you, President Case, Governing Board members, Cabinet, and guests. And tonight we provide the first reading for revisions uh, to the Family Student Handbook for the 23-24 school year. Mr. Long and Dr. Ospisil will present. President Case, members of the board, Dr. Bales, cabinet, and members of the community, my name is Chris Osmussen, and I am pleased to present the recommended revisions to the, to the 2023-2024 Family Student Handbook. This evening, I will review the purpose of the Family Student Handbook Review Committee, the committee makeup, the process and timeline the committee followed, and notable recommended changes. The purpose of the committee was to review the Family Student Handbook language to ensure that the document clearly and accurately communicated the Paradise Valley Unified School District's policies, procedures, and practices. It was not the goal of the committee to recommend changes or policies to, or, to, or to make any changes to our practices. The Family Student Handbook Review Committee was created following the district's call for committee process. And you can see that the committee was made up of parents, educational support personnel, teachers, and administrators. We had representation from elementary, middle, and high school, and from learning communities across our district. For each of the sections that pertain to a specific director or a district lead, their input was gathered. As an example, Camille Unruh, the Director of Nutrition and Wellness, provided input on the food in the classrooms and food services sections of the handbook. The directors were asked to review the current language in the handbook 
and to provide their recommendations for changes, if any. As an example, our lead nurses reviewed the language in Section 3, health, in, health information, and provided recommended changes and updates. Finally, assistant principals, deans, and administrative interns were asked to review Section 4, school behavior expectations, and a few site-based leaders provided input and suggestions for new language. The review process began on February 14th, where directors and leads were provided with handbook language that fell under their purview. They were asked to review language related to their department, provide recommended changes, or a recommendation to keep the language as written. Our committee met for the first time on February 23rd. We met five times for a total of six hours. However, please know that the committee members volunteered much more of themselves than attending meetings. Once we got started, the committee members were assigned homework to read sections of the handbook before the next meeting. And in addition, some of our work was done electronically over email, with a few revisions and suggested language discussed electronically after our last meeting on April 20th. The committee wrapped up this year's review on May 8th, with committee members reviewing and approving the summary of changes electronically. Again, the process began with directors and lead staff reviewing handbook language related to their departments and areas of expertise. The handbook committee looked at, the, looked at their suggestions, if any were made, um, that were made by the directors, and then as a whole group, the committee reviewed the language to ensure that it was clear and accurately communicated the district's policy and practice. In some cases, the committee generated new questions or wanted clarifications, and we looped back to the director for further input. That section was reassigned to, for the next meeting where it was reviewed again. This graphic just represents how the committee dialed in the handbook language for board approval. Again, starting with current um, handbook language, sending it through our directors and leads, a committee review. If needed, we would send it back to directors and leads again, a committee review, and then having it um, ready for the, the board to look at. Some notable um, changes. In addition to fixing grammatical errors and referring to parents and guardians consistently through the document, some notable changes are being recommended. First, we recommend the addition of language to clarify how the district works with students who have turned 18. When students turn 18 years old and still reside with their parents, it's the district's practice to notify parents and guardians of disciplinary actions and to require parents and guardians to approve absences and, and um, for their students' participation in events like field trips. In short, when students live with their parents and guardians, parents and guardians retain educational rights. The committee also recommends the addition of absence and makeup work language. It is the practice of the district to consider a student tardy to class when they arrive less than 10 minutes late and absent when they arrive more than 10 minutes late to a class. This can be confusing to parents and guardians when they check their students' attendance records in Infinite Campus. They may wonder how their student was considered and marked unexcused, unexcused absent when their child arrived late but was still physically in the class. The recommended language clarifies our practice. Please note that first period is treated differently for students um, as they are afforded 20 minutes of time rather than 10. In addition, the committee recommends language that describes the expectation that students may be required to turn in coursework or take assessments upon their return from an excused absence. Students are afforded a day for a day for an excused absent to make up new work. However, if they are absent on the day of an assessment or on a due date, they may be required to take the assessment or turn in the work upon their return. This recommended language explains our current practice. The Family and Student Handbook Review Committee also recommends the addition of language in each of these sections that directs parents and guardians to where and with whom they can ask for support and guidance. So um, as we read through as a committee, we found several areas that we could point parents and guardians into the right direction if they had questions related to any of these topics. 
there is language in the current family student handbook that describes the graduation requirements at each of our high schools. The committee recommends adding language that describes Arizona's move on when reading requirements in that same spirit. Site administrators work with students on a daily basis following school rules. In that process, they reference the family student handbook to define the behavior and match the infraction to an appropriate response. Although many anticipated behaviors are outlined and defined in the family student handbook, a few instances came up this year that were not clearly defined. The committee recommends the addition of language that describes the school's response to a student's refusal to a search after the school has established reasonable suspicion. It is assumed that the student is in possession of the suspected contraband if the student refuses to a search. The committee recommends the addition of language that describes the infraction of indecent exposure or public sexual indecency. In addition, the committee recommends the addition of language that describes the action to be taken by site leadership when a student violates this rule. The student finally recommend, um, also recommends that endangerment can also be putting one's own health, safe, um, health and safety at risk. Our lead nurses spent a lot of time reviewing the language in the health section, and this is one of the areas that after, committee review, after the committee reviewed the nurses' recommended changes, we had questions and asked for further clarification and revision. Ultimately, language and formatting was revised to improve the readability of the section, and in addition, language was added to include um, CBD as a home remedy that is not administrated, uh, it's administered at school or by our nursing staff. It is the recommendation of the committee that the board adopt these changes for the Family Student Handbook. And finally, the uh, Family Student Handbook Committee recommends that the governing board members be updated. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Are there any questions, Mrs. Christensen? Did you carefully look at that emancipation um, item? Because it's my understanding that when a child is eight, between the age of 18 and less than 22, even if they're in the public schools, that they're emancipated and they can check themselves in and out. And it's the if you look at ARS 15-773, you could transfer the rights back to the parents at the age of majority if the pupil has a disability. Um, but it's my, and it, it, so what I would recommend is that you double check uh, the Arizona revised statutes on Title 15, because I, I'm pretty sure that once a child is 18, um, I know that the school districts would encourage them to, to still check in with their parents, even though they're living with them. Um, it, um, it's my understanding that they are already emancipated just by the fact that they turned 18. So if you can look into that, that would, and get clarification, that would be- Board Member Christensen, great. absolutely. That has been our practice, but I will verify, double check, and make sure that upon final read, the information is accurate for you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd made note of that too. I was worried about any kind of litigation we might open ourselves up for. Some student says, oh, my privacy has been violated because they told my parents I wasn't at school. You know, these guys that are living at home. So yeah, I, I have the same concern on that one. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I do like the fact that there's more links and abilities for parents to, you know, uh, find out more about bullying, find out more about this, that, or the other thing built right into the documents. They can find out their answers and have a little more control over what's going on with their, with their household. And I, I like that a lot. Any other comments? I would like to thank the committee. It looks like you guys had some great participation and you did a really good job. So thank you for, and thank the committee for all their hard work. Absolutely. And upon final read, hopefully they'll be here and we can recognize them together. Oh, great. Um, this is just the first reading. We'll this back is the first reading. I also first. want to thank the committee. That's a lot of time and a lot of hard work. So thank you very much, committee. They gave up themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Next on items for discussion, consideration, uh, Dr. Bells. Thank you, President Case, Governing Board members. Uh, tonight we present also for first reading, uh, revisions to the Family Athlete Handbook for the 23-22 school year, 23-24 school year, Mr. Long. 
Thank you. Uh, good evening, President Case, Governing Board Members, Dr. Bells and Cabinet. Today I present to you for a first reading the revisions to the 2023-24 Family Athlete Handbook. This evening I will review the purpose of the Family Athlete Handbook Review Committee, the committee makeup, the process and timeline the committee followed, and a few notable recommended changes. The purpose of the committee was to review the Family Athlete Handbook language to ensure that the document clearly and accurately communicated the Paradise Valley Unified School District's policies, procedures, and practice in regards to athletics. The Family Athlete Handbook Review Committee was created following the district's call for committee process. Our committee was comprised of parents, athletic directors, and principals. The committee began meeting early March and concluded their work in late April. We had two in-person meetings and one virtual meeting. The remaining work edits and inputs were completed through email communication. The most notable change was to add Arizona Revised Statute 15120.02, which states that each interscholastic athlete team or sport shall be designated as one of the following based on the biological sex of the students who participate on the team or sport as male, men or boys, females, women or girl, and co-ed or mixed. Athletic teams or sports designated for females, women or girls may not be open to students of the male sex. Any student may participate in any interscholastic intramural ath athletic team or sport designated as being for males, boys, or designated as co-ed or mixed. For better understanding, the committee also added a code of conduct table summary so that families could easily see an infraction and consequences. The information is not new and is already included in the handbook, but this is a friendly visual that was added. During our committee meetings, there was also a discussion about healthy athletes and the number of athletes for each trainer. We thought that it was necessary to add language regarding priority is, give, is to be given to in-season athletes first. Another notable change included ed editing language on how the random drawing of assigned numbers are handled for drug testing. And another change is we needed to add the names of the governing board members. We did not have that in our previous handbooks. With that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Are there any questions from the governing board? Well, I just found it kind of interesting. I know you had to add the part for the state law about gender, but and maybe I'm reading it wrong, but it says basically um, if you're, if I'll just do a couple sports as an example. A girls softball team, a, a guy can't play on that team. Correct. But a guy's baseball team, a girl could play on that team. You are correct. Okay. That's always been the case. I think the original Title IX was to, to protect female sports. And so, a, a for instance, a, a girl could be on a, a boy's football team. I thought team Title IX was not just soccer. about girls, but anybody... Like if Title IX, the original, I'm talking about Title the original IX, intent of Title IX. Yeah, if you take it through exactly the way it is, a guy, uh, a guy should be able to play on a girls' softball team. You know, it's, that's how I thought it was supposed to be. But that's, I'm just, that's why I wanted clarification, make sure I'm reading this right. That's all I'm worried about. Right, but we that's also correct, have to so follow the law. Yeah, ARS 15-120.2. Uh, Are there any other comments? Mr. Greenberg. Yeah, on, I apologize because I didn't get a chance to go through this as early. I would have given this to Dr. Bales um, ahead of time. Um, there's a section on hazing, um, which is great, which is section five on page four. Um, and then we talk about the code of conduct and it feels like the code of conduct is not exclusively, but primarily focused on shall we say, substance abuse um, and little else. And it would seem to me that wouldn't things like hazing and actual other issues of conduct fall under the code of conduct? Or is there a way to, I don't know if this is an AIA separation or not. It just, it feels like when I think of code of conduct, I think of all conduct and rather than 
the majority focus on on substance abuse, shall we say. So I don't, it just feels like, is there a way to kind of make one, one put, put it back together. together? That sounds like a really way. good idea. That sounds like an excellent idea. We will take that back and get that organized. It's not an AIA. This is our arrangement. So we can certainly look at that. Any other comments? May I say thank you to the committee who worked on this, I think, and their new names, and we appreciate that. And we appreciate all the long, hard hours they spent working on this. And having signed many of these before, there's a lot that goes into these. So thank you very much. Any other comments? Okay, that was the first read. Next one on the agenda for discussion, Dr. Bells. Thank you, President Case, Governing Board members, Cabinet, and guests. And tonight we present uh, for first reading also a proposed price increase for an a la carte milk carton for the 23-24 school year. This would be an increase to the price, milk price that we charge students, currently 25 cents, increasing to 50 cents. Uh, the last increase in milk prices was prior to 1987. Uh, then, of course, the cost of producing and distributing milk has significantly increased. We understand truly that this is uh, increase may cause some inconvenience, uh, some hardship, um, but it is necessary to maintain the quality of milk that we provide our students, which meets uh, national school lunch program guidelines. Scottsdale Unified currently charges 80 cents per carton. Deer Valley charges 50 cents. Peoria, 35 cents, but Peoria is also considering an increase in their price for next year, uh, from what we understand. Uh, this is just a first reading, but our Director of Nutrition and Wellness, Camille Unruh, is here as well to answer any questions that you may have. I just have one simple one. I mean, this is just milk. It's not all the other things the kids drink, like the juices or the orange juice or the chocolate milk. It's just milk. Right. Oh, there you are, um, Mr. Pantera. We, we, so. we have one. We yeah. We have to call oh, for a motion. Sorry, I didn't know. Thank no. You. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh. I kind of let that go. Um, so we have one public comment. A Catherine Millward. Is she there. Thank you. Currently, PVUSD charges 25 cents for a carton of milk. At the um, as the cost of 1% and flavored milk is approximately 23 cents a piece, and the cost of fat-free milk is approximately 22 cents a piece, the district makes two to three cents profit on each carton sold. Shamrock Farms has informed the district of an increase of two and a half cents. This puts the cost a half a cent over current charge for 1% in flavored milk and a half a cent below the current charge for fat-free milk. As a result of this small increase in net cost, the district wants to double the cost to the student to 50 cents, making a cool profit of 25 and a half cents on the fat-free milk and 24 and a half cents on the flavored and 1% milk. The majority of students who bring their lunch to school and buy milk do so because they fall into that donut hole between those who qualify for free school lunch and those who can't afford to pay for school lunch every day. These students need the nutrition that fresh milk provides. A fair increase would be to charge the students 30 cents for a carton of milk. This increase would provide the district a higher profit margin than previously realized while still being affordable for the students. The district would make a four and a half cent profit on the flavored and 1% milk and a five and a half cent profit on the fat free milk. As Phoenix is currently experiencing the highest inflation in the nation and will be for the foreseeable future, it would be helpful to our students and their families to charge the lowest price possible. Please vote down the current proposal of 50 cents a carton and consider a more fair increase of 30 cents per carton. Thank you very much. Um, do you have any comments? Oh, I, oh we're not, it's just the first reading. It's not the first reading. Are there any board? But I'd like I made them from, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I have a question. Could you come up and answer any questions? So what, what financial information do you have on this? For what we're currently being charged? Yes. For? So this year in particular, the market's been fluctuating so much that we were actually paying 27 cents per carton in December of 2022. So it changes month to month, and we have actually been paying more for milk than what we've been charging. Um, my recommendation for 50 cents was because all of our prices within the food service are in quarter increments. So it matches our current pricing and would also support for any future market changes, which we do pr predict are going to continue. Okay. Are there any comments by board members now? Well, yeah, this any is, more questions? This is just milk or all the things the kids are drinking. This is just milk, and it's only milk purchased a la carte. So students who purchase a breakfast or a lunch, the milk is included in that price. And we've had this price since, what, 1987, 1988? Do you know what they were charging for milk then? I do not. I actually asked the previous food service director, and she started in 1987, and she relayed to me that it was 25 cents when she started. Even and that? that's the historic information I have on that. Interesting. Okay, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? just curious how they come up with the price of milk because I, I know our gas fluctuates like crazy I, I I had no idea that that the the price of milk fluctuates from I mean how often do they who sets the price and I guess the milk it producers or quite often and um this is something that we've been aware of for the past few years it's something we've been putting off though because we understand our families are dealing with hardships ever since the COVID-19 pandemic so it's something that we've been waiting to look at but based off the data this year we've seen it being pushed up and up and it's going to continue to increase we believe. And so was the decision to do the 50 cents based on you you kind of alluded to it a little bit you're concerned that we don't want to raise it this year and then have to raise it again in the future. You were trying to find a an area where we can raise it and not have to raise it for many years. Is that was that kind of okay. the thing? Um because if we do raise it to say 35 cents and match Peoria, Peoria understands that with the market increases that they will also have to assess and it would just put it to a place to where we wouldn't have to reassess the price for quite a while. Any other comments? I really don't know what to say on this. I really don't. I understand what you're doing. I mean, I could say it was a nickel when I was in school, but that was a long time ago. Okay, any other comments? But the lunch is 25 cents too. Extra milk was 25. Any comments, Ann? Mrs., yeah. Um, I mean, there was, there was obviously a comment about making a profit. Um, that's not the intent here. The intent is to cover our costs, which also include personnel, I presume. I mean, we have to price knowing that we have staff in our, um, you know, food service department in our cafeterias. And those costs are going up as well. As we know, most workers in our food service department are um, ESPs and that we have increases every January simply because of minimum wage. So, the point is not to look for a profit, but it's to ensure that we can cover costs and not have to do this again. I mean, granted, we took, you know, how many years to do this, um, but I think the expectation or the hope is not to have to do it again in two or three years. So, And um, we are Fund 510, so we are self-funded, so we are required to make sure that we support our own staff. Um, we are required to price items appropriately based off of the non-program foods from USDA as well, which means that um, they have to be priced separately so that we're not using reimbursement from free and reduced meals to cover the cost of the non-program foods as well. So we are held to that as well. What are the prices in the other districts again? Uh, Scottsdale Unified School District is 80 cents. Uh, Deer Valley is 50 cents, Peoria is 35 cents, and when I spoke with the director, she said that they've been charging 35 cents for over 20 years. So they've kept that price for quite a while. Okay, it's not just this, the cost of the milk, it 
I mean, part of the cost is the transportation to get there, the distribution of it. I mean, it goes on and on and on because the milk cartons are eight ounces, I think. Yes, eight ounces. Eight ounces. Okay. Well, I really don't know what to say. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That's a first reading. Before we adjourn, I would like to remind you that the next regular board meeting will be held on June 1st after school is over, and it will be at 3 p.m., okay? 3 p.m., not 7, not 5, but 3 p.m. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion passes unanimously.